There's a term in Pali, Sat Bodhisattva, which can be translated in a lot of different ways. A person of integrity, a mature person, literally means a true person. And the Buddha often pairs it with a noble person. The kind of person you want to associate with, the kind of person whose habits you want to pick up. And as you said, this sort of person has seven qualities. The first is one that you can learn from books, which is what the Dharma is. Well, of course, in the back of the time of the Buddha, when there were no Dharma books, you have to learn it from someone who'd memorized the Dharma, which meant that you had to have respect for that sort of person, because nobody's going to teach people things if the student doesn't res show respect. And the attitude of respect is also important, just being around the person it makes you more open to that person's influences person's ways of thinking, ways of dealing with other people. The more open you are, the more you pick up whatever good things there are in that person's behavior. So back in the time of the Buddha, even that first quality of a, good, of a true person, knowing the Dharma, was something you had to pick up by being with that person. Nowadays, of course, there are books, there's stuff out on the internet, so it's pretty easy to learn what the Dharma is. But then you come up with the next one, next quality, which is knowing the meaning of the Dharma. And I've come to realize more and more you don't really know the meaning of the Dharma until you've been with a person who embodies the Dharma. You look at all the Buddhist scholars who've read books for years and years, know the languages, and come up with pretty crazy teachings. And there was one who came up with the idea that the Brahma Viharas were an alternative path. All I had to do was just sit there and think good thoughts of goodwill, and that would take you all the way to Nirvana. This was a scholar who'd studied Buddhism for many years. So just being with the books doesn't mean you're going to understand them. You, if you live with someone who embodies the teaching, embodies the practice, you get a sense of, oh, this is what's meant by this quality, this is what's meant by that quality. It's an intuitive sense that you pick up by being around a person who embodies it. So what are some of the things you want to look for? One is how to gain a sense of What's enough? Enough conversation, enough food, enough sleep. You see the other person. And it's not just seeing the other person. You listen to the person's ways of working this out for him or herself. Because the right amount of food and sleep for one person may not be the right amount for another person, or the right amount for you this week may not be the right amount next week. Because, as the Buddha said, there are, there are times when you can indulge in sensual pleasures of certain sorts, and it doesn't have any impact on your practice, doesn't pull you back. So it's perfectly okay. As he said, he doesn't criticize pleasure that is in accord with the Dharma. But if you find that by indulging in certain pleasures, they may seem innocent enough, but if you find indulging them over time, you're beginning to get lazy and heedless. We've got to realize we've got to put those pleasures aside. Not to practice with some pain. And for the Buddha, that meant both physical pain and practice with contemplating the foulness of the body, which is an unpleasant topic. It's not one that's easy to, to keep at. But there are times when you realize you've got to do it, otherwise your mind's going to go run 
running wild with its desire for pleasure. So you have to learn a sense of what's just right for you at a particular time. You have to learn how to read your own behavior. This fits in with another quality, which is atta which means knowing yourself, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, what you've got to work on. If you know you have a tendency towards extreme behavior, you've got to calm it down. If you know you have a tendency to lie to yourself, you've lied to yourself in the past, you've got to be extra on top of things. Wherever you know your weaknesses, learn how to compensate. And living with a good person helps, helps with this, because you get a sense of where balance is. And where your weaknesses are. Gal and Yuta, knowing the right time and place for things. When to speak, when not to speak. Staying with the John Fu, I knew that he had some pretty sharp opinions. But he didn't talk about them all the time. There were times when I was waiting for him to give somebody a good blast, and he didn't. Other times when it came out of left field, didn't expect it at all. And so I had to come to notice, okay, what would make him make a critical remark or be very frank about something? And other times, why would he not be so open with his opinions? And this was just one of many things that had to do with the right time and the right place. The time to be familiar with him, the time when he was going to be distant. It took a while to learn how to read these things. But then I found that it was very useful. I could learn how to read other people a lot better, too. I found that my dealings with senior monks in Thailand in general got a lot smoother because I had that experience with a John Fu when he was sharp with me when I tried to be too familiar. So learning the right time, having a sense of time and place. This is a really important part of the practice. It's not something you can be taught in books, but you can pick it up by being around good people. This connects with the, the next quality, which is having a sense of how to behave in different groups of people. In India, of course, there were very clear social divisions. There were Brahmins, and there were noble warriors, and there were householders, and people of the lower castes. And each caste had a particular way of behavior that was appropriate for that. John Lee makes a lot of this. He says that when the Buddha was with old people, he would make himself old. In other words, think about the kind of things they were thinking about, talk in terms of their language. When he was with younger people, he would adjust his language to be right with younger people. And even though we don't have castes in our modern society, we do have lots of different groups of people with whom you have to learn how to speak and behave in the right way. Especially as monks, we want to learn how not to be offensive. I think about the story of Sariputta seeing Asaji. It was just his manners, just Asaji's manners that impressed Sariputta, made him want to ask him questions. So you want to learn how the proper manners for dealing with different people of different sorts. And if you've got a good teacher, I can't say that I'm 100 percent skilled in this, this particular area, but I'm learning. And these are important skills to master. We tend to forget that there is a social dimension to the practice. All the time we think about practice as sitting here with our eyes closed or doing walking meditation. But there is the practice of learning how to get along with one another. And we have to learn how to get along with all kinds of people. I know in my life as a monk I've met lots of people from different social strata that I never would have met otherwise both on the high end and on the low end. 
and you have to learn how to not think of them as high or low, but simply, okay, this type of person requires this kind of behavior. Because you want to speak to their heart. You don't want your manners to get in the way. Finally, there's a sense of how to judge people. All too often we hear that in Buddhists we try not to judge anybody, but you have to judge who you can take as a good example. It says that the people who are willing to listen to the Dharma, they're a good example. The people who pay careful attention, who try to think it through, they're a good example. The people who put in it a practice, they're a good example. So you look for people whose behavior is exemplary. Because they pull you up. They make you a better person because you want to be like them. So all of these things are qualities you can't learn from a book. You can't learn from the written word. You want to be sensitive to what's going on inside you, going on what's going on outside you. Because this kind of sensitivity helps you read subtle things in your own mind as well. You learn to be observant. You learn to have a sense of the right time and the right place, and how, how much is enough in the, in the area of the practice. How much is the right amount of time to sit and meditate? How much is the right amount to walk? How much pain should you sit with so you can learn from it? When are you ready for that kind of pain? How much pleasure can you indulge in without it being detrimental to your practice? These are all important questions you have to learn how to ask. And you want to be around good people to, to gain sensitivity to what would be a good answer. So if you want to be a true person, a mature person, these are the qualities you want to work on. They permeate everything in the practice.